about to begin.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this forum discussion. Before we proceed, let us introduce ourselves. I am Kauselia Subramaniam. And that is Pawanji Kaur. So we will be moderating for tonight's forum. First of all, I would like to give a brief introduction on Hall of Aspire. Hall of Aspire is organized by Altruistic Malaysia and it is a platform where the community can access to knowledge and information about many critical topics which not many people discuss about. This platform plays an important role in this digital era. We cover topics like peace sustainability, education, environment, health, humanitarian and economy. Today, we will be discussing about the importance and the impact of biodiversity towards life on Earth. This forum aims to bring out the knowledge behind the science of biodiversity and how it is a continuing task. Yet, beyond the knowledge of a few charismatic species, there exists a gap in public awareness about the critical role that biodiversity plays in providing the essentials for our survival and well-being. So for our topics today, we'll be having two panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Wu, Dr. Wong Siu Tae. He's the founder and CEO of Bonyan Sunbear Conservation Center. The Bonyan Sunbear Conservation Center is a sunbear rescue and rehabilitation facility being developed in Sabah, Malaysian Borneo. Here we have the next experienced panelist, Mr. Mazrul Mahadze. He is the project director of Animal Projects and Environmental Education in Berhad, popularly known as Aid Malaysia. Aid Malaysia is an accredited social enterprise that develops programs in support of conservation projects in a sustainable manner. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Wong and Mr. Mazrul to share about their view on what is biodiversity actually. Great, thank you so much, the host, for introducing us. Yeah, it is my pleasure to be able to come here and talk to you about this topic. As a Malaysian, I think there are lots of people who are not aware of how, what is biodiversity, and then uh, what is you know going on with our bio biodiversity, especially in Malaysia. Yeah. So, uh, so for me, I if I, you ask me what is biodiversity, I think. The very first thing that we need to know about the word biodiversity. Bio literally translates into life. And then diversity is variety. So biodiversity is the variety of life. Okay. And then uh, in general, you need to talking about uh, life, you know, every from plants in, 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 in this world, there are five different kingdoms of life, you know, starting from the protista, from monera, from fungi, from animals, and from plant, and all of these have a lot of variety. And then, uh, in general, when we talk about biodiversity, we have uh, 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 we we are talking about there are three different levels of biodiversity, and then first starting with genetic diversity. You know, say for example, we all are humans, like people, yeah, Homo sapiens, but we do have variety. Say. I'm Chinese, I'm, you know, yellow skin, black hair, and then if there are Caucasians, they are uh, blonde, they are, you know, um, different look, skin color, and if you're Indian, you got darker skin and things like that. So that is the, but we are all the same species, that is what we call as the diversity at, variety at the genetic level, you know, say another example would be different kind of dogs, for example. All different kind of breeds of dogs are still the same. They are dogs, but they have different genetics uh, properties, and then you know they show. And then with this with these differences, some dogs are big, small, long hair, short hair, and things like that. And the second level is the species diversity. You know, some closely related species. There are many different other species. Say, for example, uh, in Malaysia, if you are a uh, a uh, fish fan, for example, if you uh, you know like to have this uh, uh, fighting fish betta, so there's a uh, many species of bettas, you know. So they are that that is what we call as the betta di uh, species diversity. 
And then uh, thirdly, the third level is the ecosystem diversity, uh, looking at our environment, there are different kinds of places. Say, for example, in Malaysia, we have our lowland rainforest, we have our uh, peat swamp forest, we have our mangrove forest, we have the uh, lowland, uh, they have the hill deep trocar forest, we have the montane forest, and all, and, and also, like, say, for example, uh, the limestone forest and things like that. So, different places create all different kind of uh, ecosystems. So, that's why these three levels. Genetic species and ecosystem diversity. Yeah. Masru, do you want to add anything? Uh, I think for now, this is, uh, you know, I think you covered it. So, yeah, three expect. Uh, and then I think tonight, you know, probably uh, we're going to be a little bit biased, maybe focusing more on, you know, uh, Malaysian biodiversity. Uh, so, yeah. So, I think, yeah, uh, that, that Dr. Wong already covered that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wong and Mr. Masro for your explanation. I'm sure now our audience would have some insight on what biodiversity is now. Following that, can I have Dr. Wong to explain whether species diversity follow any patterns? Uh, yes, actually, species diversity definitely follows some kind of patterns. You know, so say, for example, all animals or plants, they have the... Uh, the limit of tolerance. So say, for example, some animal can tolerate hot weather, some animals are not uh, tolerate hot weather, for example, say bears, okay? Polar bears are evolved in northern, uh, north, north pole regions where the climate is very cold. They got thick, uh, long hairs, and then their skin is actually black. You know, there's a lot of adaptations for them to stay in or live in a very cold climate. And then whereas our sun bears, yeah, uh, they have this short, sleek black fur and they're adapted to this tropical weather. So they do have some kind of a patterns. So, 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 so most of these patterns is followed, say, for example, their environment. You know whether the temperature is hot or cold the temperature is uh, the, the 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 environment is is wet or dry and that kind of thing you know and then uh and, and secondly all other uh animals where they distribute all this you know biodiversity they of course all animals have to live yeah and then uh and then uh they have to find their food whether they can survive is depending on whether they can survive or not you know, say for example, a tropical rainforest. Our tropical rainforest is rich of biodiversity, is rich of life, either plants, animals, fungi, you know, single cell animals, you name it. It's always very rich. Why? Because our tropical rainforest in uh, Malaysia, especially, you know, Borneo, Sumatra, and, and, and West Malaysia, are very humid all year long the temperature is relatively stable all year long and then the solar radiation has been very high all year long and that creates an optimal living environment for many many plant species many many animal species so that's why our rainforest have so many species of plants animals fungi monera protista you name it you know because of our kind of weather our kind of environment is suitable for a lot of species uh, to, to, to survive. And then another opposite of our rainforest would be like, say, extreme environment, say desert, so dry, so hot. You know, not many species can live there or polar regions, so cold. And there's hardly any food, you know, ice all the, all the time. That's why you don't see a lot of life over there, except there are certain uh, kind of wildlife or plants or you know life form can adapt to that kind of harsh environment and survive there so they do so that's why you know do species uh, do species diversity follow any pattern yes definitely a big time follow this kind of uh, patterns yeah you're muted yeah thank you dr wong for your answer you're welcome. Okay, so moving on to uh, Mr. Masro. Uh, hold on. Uh. Okay, 
Okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, Mr. Mazro, how many species go extinct every day in the planet? And in Malaysia particularly, how many species are in danger and also extinct? Uh, okay. Uh, how many species? Uh, you know, that's a very difficult question, actually. You know, uh, because, but I think in order to understand, you know, how many species go extinct uh, every day, because that is very specific, I think we need to, uh, we need to look at, you know, what are the numbers of species that are there uh, in, in this world so that we, then we know that, you know, whether that number is big or whether that number is small. So if you look at literature, you know, some, you know, believe that they are close to, you know, estimated 15 million uh, different species uh, uh, that live on our planet. So that is a higher estimate. There's a, also another numbers that say, you know, there's between uh, eight to nine million of species of plant and animal in existence. And then out of that, uh, out of like 15 million, we only know two million of them currently, around two million of them are uh, being described by scientists. Uh, so if you look at that number, uh, again, you know, 15 million and then 2 million that are we uh, uh, known or described by, uh, by the scientists, then to know uh, how many species that we lost every day, then, you know, we can have a higher estimate, we can have a low estimate. Uh, so on, on the, on the high, low estimate, I think we are looking at uh, losing 150 to 200 species a day. Uh, but I think the most important question is, you know, how quickly can we identify all of the other remaining species? Because, uh, you know, like, like I said, it, it's only 2 million have been described. So that's, you know, uh, another 13 million that we still, you know, we still being discovered almost every day. Uh, so, you know, we might not know what we lose, uh, you know, because we didn't describe or found it yet. I think, you know, that's uh, uh, another important question. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mazro. Dr. Wong, the next question is for Dr. Wong. What is endemic species? Okay, endemic species. Okay, endemic species refer to a species that found in a certain regions or a country on islands and no found anywhere else, okay? It can be a country extinction if you define that geography region as a country or safe, or you can uh, or you can say that the endemic species is from a region, say for example, Borneo. Borneo is an island, right? Yeah, so there are few endemic species that found in Borneo and not other places. Say for example, the proboscis monkey, the monkey with big nose, you guys know, seen the picture or not, proboscis monkey? Yeah, so proboscis monkey is an endemic species that only found in Borneo. So it is a Borneo endemic, not found anywhere. Say, for example, koala bear. Uh, well, no, no, koala, yeah, only found in Australia. So koala is endemic to Australia, yeah. But is proboscis monkey endemic to Malaysia? No, because in Borneo, Proboscis monkey also found in Kalimantan, also found in uh, Brunei as well. So it is not a, a Malaysian endemic, but it is a Borneo endemic, so to speak. And uh, yeah, so this is what endemic species means. So some endemic species can be as endemic as a, like, say, for example, a limestone hill. You know, some species of snail only found on certain, uh, certain, certain limestone uh, hill and no found anywhere. So this kind of species is going, to, is going to be very, very valuable in terms of the biodiversity protection because once we lost that particular, say for example, limestone hill, that species will go extinct because it won't found in any, any place else. You know, and then there's a series in our country, there's so many endemic species that is, you know, either mammal, uh, usually is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, yeah, yeah, mammals or birds or reptile, amphibian and things like that. And then uh, there, are so, there are still many unknown species that are uh, found in our, in our rainforest and still wait for, you know, a lot of work, a lot of scientists, a lot of taxonomists to try to discover and things like that. So, yeah. So obviously there's a lot of work for us to do in our country because our country is so rich in terms of biodiversity, back to the biodiversity work. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you for your answer, Dr. Wong. Mm -hmm. uh, next, can I have Mr. Masro or Dr. Wong, either one of y'all, to explain on how biodiversity is actually measured? Uh, how biodiversity measured? Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, if I may start a little bit. So biodiversity, uh, you know, how is it measured? I think uh, if you remember what Dr. Wong explained earlier. So when we look at, you know, uh, biodiversity, we are looking at, you know, in, uh, whether it's a habitat uh, uh, level, species or genetic. Uh, so if you look at species, so one way that uh, uh, biodiversity are being measured is, uh, I think the, the most uh, uh, frequent uh, way to look at it is looking at the numbers of species or we call it species richness so for example like you know uh, how many mammals are there in malaysia or how many mammals are there in let's say in borneo island so you are counting species so you know and then usually when when uh, this uh, you see that you know uh, i think normally you you hear about borneo you you hear about uh, amazon because these are some of the area where you know the species richness is very high so you can look at species uh, richness and then uh, secondly you can also look at, uh, look at species evenness so species evenness is looking at how close in numbers each species uh, is an environment okay for example like uh, we have uh, let's say in borneo we have or in one area in borneo we you know we have elephant and then we have uh, let's say clouded leopard so there's two species but you know maybe one species are higher in numbers so you know high, higher in numbers uh, and then if you can compare it with like say peninsula malaysia so borneo and peninsula malaysia have you know uh let's say a uh, equal amount of species but species evenness the numbers of individual of each species might be different so you know and that that's you know one way to, you can measure biodiversity and then there are many ways that uh, we can do this uh, to meaning that to count because we're looking at numbers. So, you know, you, you can conduct survey uh, and then I think one of the uh, common way that public are aware of, you know, you uh, survey using camera trap uh, because especially, you know, in our environment in Malaysia, if you want to uh, look at especially mammals, especially animals, uh, if you just uh, walk in the jungle, most probably you'll see a track of animal, not the animal itself. So, you know, one way or one of the the best way to do it is to set up camera trap so you know that that's a, a example of you know how biodiversity uh, can be measured okay uh thank you mr mazro for your explanation the biodiversity of an ecosystem contributes to the sustainability of that ecosystem the higher the biodiversity of an ecosystem the more sustainable it is the higher, bio, the higher biodiversity in an ecosystem means that there is a greater variety of genes and species in that ecosystem. How does biodiversity provide sustainability? Dr. Wong, can you please tell us about it? Yeah, how does biodiversity provide sustainability? I think, you know, if you have, uh, people have to think about, okay, when you have more species or, or, or higher biodiversity in a certain regions or a certain place um, it creates it creates more sustainability in terms of say for example more species they are more linked or more food change in between say for example if i'm a tiger okay if there are a lots of species out there in our forest i have more choice you know say for example in borneo what we are facing right now is the, is the bearded pigs yeah, having a crisis uh, called uh, African swine fever, literally wipe out uh, the local bearded pig population. For a clouded leopard who used to eat this uh, bearded pigs, yeah, prey on this bearded pig, and right now all the bearded pigs in the forest gone already. So if this forest have a lot of biodiversity, have a lot of other animals, I have choice. Okay, I may go and eat the the jungle, the mouse deer, la, or the um, or, or the munchak, la, or the deer, la, or the monkey, la, and things like that. So they are more choice. So the so usually when we refer to like say food change, the the more or the higher biodiverse area have more stability because uh, in Chinese they they say bo hu hen ho. There's no fish, shrimp also okay ma, you know. 
you know, just like when you go to a hawker center, there's so many variety. So this hawker, this favorite hawker center, your favorite hawker center, your hawker, your, your favorite hawker food, tonight, close shop, it's okay. Next door also have, also roti canai also okay, ma. You know, so you have to think about this. So that's why when we said there are more uh, species, high biodiversity, there are more, sus- more stable in terms of this, of the ecosystem. And from the uh, food perspective, same as well with the, with the plants, you know, if there are more plants, more food for other animals that eat on plants and then, uh, and then, and then, and then, yeah, same as well. And then just now I mentioned about the three level of biodiversity. Yeah. First of all, I talk about the uh, genetic diversity, the species diversity, and then the ecosystem diversity. So just now I refer to the species diversity. What about the genetic diversity? So if there are more genes out there, more variety out there, so those, those animal or those plant that cannot adapt to a certain change of environment, they will, uh, they will not survive. If there are more genes, more, more genetic diversity, and then if there is something bad happen to the environment, at least, you know, this kind of a genetic diversity level can survive, can make it, you know, they have more choices, they can, they are more adaptable uh, and, and make the whole system more stable. More stable means that the life, the animal, the plants or whatever life form that you are talking about manage to survive, manage to thrive, especially during the harsh time. Yeah. And then uh, you have to you have to understand that you know through evolution all this wild you know our rainforest is 130 million years old uh, lots of wild plant and wild animals have been adapting all these times until what we are seeing today yeah until what we are seeing today and then uh, and 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 so so it is extremely important to have that kind of that kind of uh, food webs together that kind of connection together that kind of link together so so in general the more uh diverse in the ecosystem the more uh uh sustainability they have you know compared to another ex- extreme uh site say for example polar region yeah right now polar bear face one big threat because of global climatic change the sea ice is melting and then polar bear used to uh hunt seal on an ice, yes, on with the sea ice, the, the, the seal would you know come out and take air from the from the from from the ice sheet. When there's no uh, when there's no um, uh, sea ice, the seal cannot come out, and then the bear, the polar bear, cannot hunt for seal. Then if the bear cannot hunt for seal, they don't have other deer to hunt. They don't have other pigs to hunt. You know, they have to have they only have one kind of food, which is seal. So that means that you know that. That ecosystem is less stable or less sustainable if there is something bad happened. Yeah. So so that's the concept like, between biodiversity and sustainability. Yeah. Okay, I hope I Thank answered. You, Dr. Wong. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for the explanation. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, this next question is for Mr. Masrol. I know this question is a bit simplistic. It is also not only about the plants, but more about the photosynthetic organisms. However, in this time of global biodiversity crisis, we are constantly confronted with prioritizing. Recently, I read somewhere that in the Arctic, the photosynthetic algae should be taken care of and not the polar bears. Also, in the temperate regions where the habitats are under enormous pressure, shouldn't we pay the greatest attention to the producers? On the local level, I am constantly confronted with the question, who do we save first? Do plants have a higher conservation value than animals? <laughs> okay, so that's a long question. Uh, yeah, I think if you're looking at, you know, the state of where, you know, we are now, if you want to say, you know, sh- who should we save first? Should we pay more attention to plant or, you know, should we pay more attention to the animal? And then looking at, you know, the uh, climate change uh, and the situation right now, I think we don't have a choice. You know, we need to save, you know, we need to give equal importance to everything because you cannot just, you know, uh, just saving the animal by ignoring the, uh, the habitat because the animal need habitat to survive. So, you know, you need to protect the habitat and then at the same time help the animal. 
because you know there's no point you know you, you have all these uh, uh, people uh, working towards saving uh, you know certain species of animal like you know like Dr. Wong with the sun bear but the the habitat where the sun bear uh, uh, can live and survive are you know diminishing every day so you know i think uh, you know we we need to give uh, equal importance uh, because uh, for an ecosystem to survive you need all of it you know together that's why uh, you know it is known as ecosystem because every single thing in the ecosystem is like uh, you know uh, it's like a, a very oil, a well oil engine you take one component then you know it will slow down the engine and then uh, you know uh, when uh, so many components are being removed then you know there will be reach a time where the engine will just stop working uh, so yeah i think you know if uh, you ask me who do we save first uh, we need to you know uh, because now we have a, a lot of scientists we have a lot of groups you know there's a groups that focusing on mammals that group that focusing on climate so you know everybody is uh, doing you know uh, uh, doing what they know best and then uh, yeah it, everything needs to move together uh, because we are at a critical stage now. Yeah, and can I add in something? <laughs> oh yes, you. Will. Yeah. So, 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 so the question asks: uh, Do plants have a higher conservation value than animals? Uh? for me, I think is 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 equal. You know, you know what? If if you are talking about plants and animal as two different groups, lah, uh, I think they all equal, and all of them have a certain value because plants, well, because a lot of animals are, 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 are eating plant as well. If there's no plant, the animal will survive as well. This is why we need to have this intact or complete or balanced ecosystems in order for everybody to live happily ever after, you know. So, so, so we must not ignore the tiny little thing, yeah, tiny little thing that is equally important as well. However, in uh, the world of conservations or in the or in the field of bio uh, of, of biology we do have some species that is more important uh, so to speak uh, compared to others and we do have this keystone species concept yeah so keystone species means that that particular species has very few biomass in the ecosystem but they affect a lot of species, say for example, ficus, fig tree, okay, fig, big strangling fig, okay, a few fig, a few uh, figs in the forest affect uh, matters because there are so many, almost all of the fruit eating animals, uh, birds, mammals, insects, reptiles, you name it, in our rainforest, it fits, okay, so that particular, although it is representing by very, very few individuals, but many species, you know, depend on them for their survival. So this kind of uh, keystone species often is uh, is the is the target for conservations. Is the target for species to save. If we lost that particular this keystone species, then many species will go next thing. Say for example, sun bears. You know, sun bears. They are forest doctor. They are forest engineer. They are forest farmers. They are forest. Uh, they are food providers. You know, they are very important seed plant, uh, uh, forest planters. They affect both plants and animals. If sun bears become locally extinct in a forest or in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a forest ecosystems, then other species that depending on sun bears may go extinct as well. You know, so this is why the keystone species concept is another, is, is another very, very important uh, uh, concept uh, in terms of what species to prioritize given that if you have limited uh, resources to conserve or to help you know so this is one and then another uh, concept is so-called uh, umbrella species yeah umbrella species means that these species require a lot of you know require I mean require a lot of resources to live you know, say for example, orangutan is so is what we call as umbrella species. You know, if you use this particular umbrella species, iconic, uh, very charisma, and then if you save that particular species, many species that live with live symmetrically live together with the orangutan will be protected as well, especially in terms of the habitat protection. So that's why in Malaysia, you know, some of the 
uh, large mammal or become the icon of conservation or orangutan, tiger, elephants, rhino. Unfortunately, our rhino already gone. Yeah, so these are the so-called umbrella species that always become the focus of our conservation work. So if you save that particular umbrella species, other species may also be safe as well. So these are the, you know, when you want to prioritize them. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mazra and Dr. Wong on your answers. I really like how you both emphasized on saving both animals and plants. It is, it is, as it is very important to balance the ecosystem. Yep. Moving on to the next question, uh, Mr. Mazro, how does preserving biodiversity come into conflict with human interests? Uh, okay, so yeah, how can preserving biodiversity come into conflict with human interests? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, this uh, conflict can uh, uh, happen because of, uh, you know, few reasons. Uh, I think, for example, like if you're looking at, you know, uh, preserving biodiversity, usually usually it's surrounded around an uh, economic factor. Economic factor, that's one example. Uh, because, uh, for example, like, you know, people always say that, uh, uh, you know, there's a problem with uh, palm oil, uh, too many palm oil plantation. Uh, but, you know, but you need to understand that you know uh a country also need uh economy uh to to you know uh to thrive it to, to thrive to look after it people uh so you have that conflict of you know uh how do you balance between you know have uh try to have a very uh a, a, a prosper economy and also saving uh for example species or uh, area uh, area of forest uh, recently we see that you know uh, the issues with uh, uh, Kuala Langat uh, forest reserve uh, the north Kuala Langat forest reserve uh, you know in Selangor where you know it uh, it was uh, degazed so that you know it can be uh, it can be turned into uh, uh, areas of uh, industry and also you know uh, basically they want to uh, they, they want to uh, degazette the area, but you know, uh, luckily we managed to save it. So that's one example. And then you know, another example you can also see that uh, saving biodiversity sometimes interfere with uh, tradition, tradition or maybe uh, religion. Sometimes you know, uh, especially like uh, one example is uh, maybe one tribe uh, used to the tradition of using you know certain feathers of uh, animal. Uh, in the uh, celebration, see, so uh, it, it is their tradition. So they, you know, they will hunt this animal for that. But you know, then you have conservation is telling them that this species uh, is endangered. So you know, you cannot, you know, hunt down this animal. So then, you know, you see that's another level of conflict as well. Uh, so yeah, so usually, you know, this conflict happen because of you know human try to fulfill certain needs, uh, and also, but that need is coming in clash uh, with uh, species or sometimes uh, uh, landscape or habitat. Yeah, can, can I add in one, yeah, one more thing? Yeah, this is a very, very interesting question and it matters everybody because us, every single one of us do have an impact to biodiversity. And then the very key point is they are many humans on planet earth right now okay so that is a key point you know right now we we are we are we have more than 7.8 billion of us living in planet earth and then our number is still growing exponentially you know and that is a very very uh, scary numbers of us multiplying 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 yeah and then uh, and then there was one day uh, a few years ago, I went to uh, I went to uh, I went to uh, Medan, Sumatra, for the very first time. Medan, chaos, so many cars, so many people. You know the road, wah! And then I was like thinking, how how the world is going to come out with that kind of food, yeah, to feed so many mouths every day. You know, once humans, every people is like that. Once we wake up. We have to have breakfast. After that, we have the tea time. After that, lunch. Another tea time, dinner, supper again. You know, some people eat like five or six times a day. 
you know and when we eat all of the food is a natural resources is a resources it have to come from somewhere either come from somewhere growing or grow in the wild or grow in plantation and blah blah and that create an impact to the land that's why in malaysia you know a lot of our rainforest has been cleared for urban plantations if you go to uh uh, uh camera highland say for example you know i did not go to camera highland often so every time i go i wait after after several years wow sakit hati why because the forest gone has become like plastic of roof you know plant vegetables plant fruit. i mean I, it's, it's not it's it yeah it's not the farmers wrong la. i mean you know they have to create that kind of food but as a humans we pose an impact to the environment to biodiversity whether we like it or not it is happening you know and and it is happening in a very alarming rate because our number is so high and not just malaysian you're talking about every single humans on earth and then when there are more of us means that they are less for other species they are less for the tiger there's less for the sun bears less for the orangutan you name it yeah. so that is the reality Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mazro and Dr. Wong. So moving forward, Dr. Wong, this question is directed to you. Why do you think it is important to conserve the living species for the natural environment? Oh, okay. So, well, first of all, you need to know the importance of, uh, of, uh, of biodiversity. Okay. So like I mentioned, the biodiversity is bio life, diversity, variety. A variety of life so this is uh this is the collective terms for all the life form because all these life forms you know provide us with so many resources say for example our food all of our food is alive in the past they used to be wild and then we cultivated them become domesticated you know and so our food it is the 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 source for our uh, food very very important it is the it is our medicine okay for human medicine all of our medicine you name it all at one time come from the wild the genetics come from the wild whether this is pen, uh, penicillin or whether this is what kind of drugs this is you know tongkat ali or whatever you know all come from, uh, from the wild so for 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 for, for medicine and then uh, the benefit of biodiversity also like i mentioned about the genetic diversity also a better provide us with a better crops variety okay better with the vegetables that is producing more food or the chicken breed that produce more meat and things like that you know so all of that and then in terms of the ecological uh service yeah it is it, it create a balance of nature you know just now when i mentioned about this uh, sustainability of biodiversity you know the more they have all this biodiversity have these ecological services uh, you know not to mention about you know the the the, the productivity side lah, yeah and then uh, it also regulates our climates you know our forest say for example regulates our climates give us clean air clean water and stable climates we cannot live without mother nature mother nature is literally a collective term for biodiversity i'm not sure whether you have seen the video uh by what nature conservancy several years ago and then there was one uh, video that played by julia roberts say i am mother nature and the, the, the last message is that you i don't need humans the mother nature do not if you need humans but humans needs mother nature because mother nature give us so many things clean air, clean water, you know, stable climates, uh, you name it, everything that we use, everything that we wear, everything that we eat, everything that we live in, you know, this house, everything come from, come from other nature. That's why the, 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 the biodiversity is so important, no matter where you go, what you are doing, you know, even your field, say, for example, energy, you know, all come from this so-called biodiversity at some point. Yeah, so all in all, it's extremely, extremely important. Yeah, and especially for Malaysia, we reach in such a biodiverse, um, rich country, you know, our forest is actually very, very important. Very, very important. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you so much for your insights, Dr. Wong. You're Mr. Welcome. Masrul, can you tell us the importance of conserving the earth biodiversity and why is biodiversity so important and worthy of protection? Uh, yeah, I think this uh, probably the, you know, uh, to extend what uh, Dr. Wong explained just now, I think the simple answer to that is uh, we need biodiversity. We have no choice, uh, you know, because uh, without biodiversity, you know, we, 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 gonna, we can live, but we're going to complain a lot. We're going to complain about, you know, why the weather is so hot now. Why, you know, why the food that I buy from the market is becoming more expensive, you know uh why you know there are there are you know uh, less variety of fish now that i can buy uh so because everything is interrelated uh you know like Do uh, dr wong said we need biodiversity and then you know everything that we produce everything that we need you know to live this world you know comfortably you know it come from somewhere but the thing is all the resources in this world is not you know uh uh infinite infinite so it, it has a limit so they boleh habis so you know you cannot just take everything out uh you know uh, from the planet because you re reach a point where we're gonna run out so so yeah so we need we need biodiversity we, we need clean air we need you know we need fresh water uh because without it you know uh we our life gonna be uh, difficult and then if you're looking at uh you know uh international level uh, uh food supply for example i, I see i mentioned about you know uh, when we have uh, this uh, uh, situation with the climate, so the food production, uh, you know, can be affected, and that food become expensive, and then uh, that, you know, if it become out of control, it can cause conflict. It can cause conflict. It can, you know, it, uh, countries can go uh, go to war over resources. So you know, if you want to live, you know, in a stable environment, not just economically, you know, uh, you know, because every now and again, you know. We complain a lot this year that, you know, well, we cannot go traveling, you know, because, uh, you know, we want to go to a nice island. We, we want to go, you know, uh, hiking in the jungle because we know that, you know, at some point we need, you know, that kind of uh, the reprieve that uh, Mother Nature uh, provide for us. So, you know, uh, that, that just, you know, some of the example like, uh, you know, why it is important because... Uh, we have no choice. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, we need uh, biodiversity. We need Mother Nature. So, like it or not, we need to uh, preserve whatever we have uh, left in this, uh, you know, like in Malaysia and, you know, uh, around the world as well. Being it wildlife, being it, you know, uh, trees, being it habitat, we need uh, to save it. Uh, because if we didn't do that, we already see the effect now. We already see the effect now. You know, if you talk to your uh, grandma, if you talk to your parent, you know, they, they will all, I'm pretty sure they will say to you that, you know, I remember this area used to be very lush, you know, you know, the weather, you know, very, very cold in the morning, you know. So that's, you know, that, whatever that they describe, you know, describing that how, you know, things have changed. And then, you know, sadly, that change didn't happen in a positive way. So, you know, so whatever that we're doing now we need to do it uh so that it didn't becoming worse for our future generation mm. so yeah yeah uh, may, may i add in you know okay. suddenly i i, I please, think about please. yeah a, a, a good example a few years ago yeah. Klang valley klv regions are having a very serious of drought you know our our reservoir water drops you know and then uh, people are not having enough water you know water crisis always happening you know either in Selangor or in Klang Valley and so on yeah and then uh, and then you know it was it was on the midst of a drought uh, and then yeah this region like central uh, west malaysia having uh, water shortages and things like that and one day i was flying to KL and then when i look at you know from the fly wow then i realized that of course we will have water shortages. Why? Because our forest is gone. A lot of the forests, a lot of the greens are all like dead, you know, they are like forest being, I mean, land has been cleared either for agricultures, for, for human activities, for factories, for this and that. And the forest is gone. You know, the forest is the place where it generates rainfall. 
you know the the the, the moisture from the forest it's actually people not many people knows about actually the trees actually in the forest the trees actually release a tiny little salt particles a tiny little particles and that catalyze that will that will attract moisture to hold on that tiny little particle and then that particles become water droplets when they up on the air when the temperature get, get cold it start to condense but it needs something to bind this water molecule and that little salt little tiny little salt is actually released by trees by the, the by, by by the plants in the forest so if you don't have the forest there is no this kind of mechanisms and the rain cloud does not form the cloud that we see every afternoon would not form and therefore they won't have any rain you know it's not that the god do not want to rain the god cannot rain no. the god don't have the recipe to make rains how <laughs> you know so you have to think about it yeah you have to think about it so you know in our forest is so rich you know when i was living in a uh, in Danum Valley, in Danum Valley, you know, when I do my research, you know, Danum Valley is is looks like mushrooms uh, background, you know, last rainforest. The trees cannot be high, fifty meters tall. Every afternoon at three o'clock, must guarantee have a big thunderstorm coming in. Why? Because throughout the day. You know, this is like north of this is like right be beside the equators. The sun shine, the forest, the the trees release the moisture as well as that little salt particles. And then when that moisture going up and up, temperature drop and drop, and they start to condense on that little salt particles, and eventually it form rain cloud. At three o'clock is the threshold, is the time where the rain cloud cannot form, cannot hold anymore. Very heavy already. That's why. We start to have rains the rhythms is the same the pattern is the same and then without this forest that's what we are facing right now when it is dry so dry 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 and then until a weather system coming in a monsoon coming in the change of the winds that brings in other bigger system coming in then we have like wow super heavy rain you know and then create this fresh flood and then when the forest uh, trees and everything has been like bad, whatever that is dropped, the plant cannot do this spongy uh, function that absorbs the rain and it let go all the rain into the into a small creek, small creek to a river, a, a river to a bigger river, and then all the water and then create mudslide, landslide, and people casualty because of that. In the past, it rarely happens, and it happens very common now today why because we clear our forest our forest is the place where biodiverse where it is a it, where it is a home for all the living life form where it is the place for biodiverse uh for biodiversity you know so 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 that concept people needs to know yeah unfortunately in our education system we don't talk about this but hopefully in the future we will yeah anyway okay so that's my little at in. Thank you for your answers, Dr. Wong and Mr. Mazrul. Okay, following that, can I have uh, Dr. Wong and Mr. Mazrul to share your thoughts on what is being done currently to preserve the biodiversity in hotspots? Okay, so what has what is being done? Yeah, actually, there's a lot of being done. You know, on uh, say, for example, uh, in in an international levels, uh, we have this uh, convention on biodiversity. Yeah, uh, CBD. So it is uh, is it is a uh, uh, international country by country managed under the United Nations to urge all countries to conserve biodiversity as much as possible. And then uh, in our uh, in our country, you know, Malaysia have this uh, national biodiversity policy, which has been implemented for quite some times now. And then right now we are reducing the next ten years of. Uh, biodiversity policy yeah and then uh, and then within a country there are all different kind of uh, all different kind of uh, uh, laws and all different kind of uh, uh, rules you know say for example uh, you have this uh, environmental quality act fishery acts you know pesticide act 
and uh, and and the uh, like say wildlife uh, conservation acts you know national park uh, acts you know all this all this law that protect our forest our biodiversity you know you simply cannot go in and hunt why because this forest uh, this wildlife is protected you cannot enter a certain uh, forest reserve to log why because it is protected you know and then uh, we do have a lot of uh, government agency uh, and that 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 are the uh, that are the um there are jurisdictions for the you know different kind of laws so so there are a, a lots of things like that uh, happening this is one way in terms of uh, government's level to protect our biodiversity yeah okay uh, Mr. Mazur, would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah, if I just want to add, you know, other than, you know, all the protection provided by law, you know, what's being done, you know, focusing on Malaysia. Uh, I think if you want to know, you know, you can also uh, find out that there's a lot of uh, groups or like NGOs, you know, that are uh, working on uh, so many areas. You know, there are NGOs that are focusing on uh, looking at uh, 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 landscape. And then there are also uh, NGOs that looking at you know uh, certain species of animal, uh, you know uh, that you know they do animal conservation. They do uh, you know a survey to find out about what are the status. So I think some of the very familiar name you have organization like WWF, you know organization like MNS, uh, and then you know we also have like you know even the Dr Wong organization itself, you know uh, San uh, Bonian Sun Bear Conservation Center, uh, you know they are doing a. a sunbag uh, conservation and then other than that you know we also have organization that are looking at you know restoring habitat uh you know uh, because we know that we as a country we already lost some of the uh, our forest uh but there are organization out there uh that uh you know working in restoring habitat uh not only that you know we, we also have uh, organization or ngos that are working uh, looking at you know marine species so you know so yeah, there's uh, so so many things being done. You know, uh, group looking at policy, group looking at uh, uh, protecting the animal on the ground itself. You know, doing patrol. Uh, you know, trying to stop people. You know, activities like illegal poaching. Uh, we have government agencies working together with NGOs uh, in that uh, in that area. Uh, so yeah, so a lot of things you know are being done. Uh, and then you know. Uh, if uh, I would like to re recommend, if uh, you know, if you want to know more, just you know, just uh, do a little bit of googling. Then you know, you can find out about all of this, and you can also be involved uh, in this, uh, you know, in this effort as well. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Wong and Mr. Masro, for your explanations. After plants and animals, will humans be the next to become extinct? This question is directed to Dr. Wong and Mr. Masro. <laughs> okay so if yeah if plant go extinct if animal go extinct for sure human will go extinct all right for sure because humans depending on plants and animal as food plants and animal as all kind of resources that we are doing you know there was one one uh so last two few years ago there was a crisis faced by the bees all right and then uh, bees, yeah, bees, you know, bees play a very important on uh, pollination, pollinates our fruits, pollinates our forests, yeah, and then, uh, and then, and then there is a crisis facing in North America or in Europe or in Africa because this bee is dying by the, by a large quantity of number abnormally. So people are starting to calculate and looking at it and then and then they have come up with some statement saying that if one day be gone extinct yeah human have about four months to live you know why because after these four months all the fruits all the vegetables all the produce that we eat are failing is not producing okay so 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 you can see how important it is to conserve every single life on earth so that they are surviving so that they are thriving so that they are populating because when they are doing well we will be doing well as well because we are just part of the system you know we cannot be taken out from the system because we are depending on all of this life form we are depending on all of these plants and animals to, to survive yeah 
so 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 when we take care of say for example climates because climates is the very important thing that control everything that affect everything if we don't con if we don't take care of our climate say for example we, right now we are facing with the climate change you know when it affect us when say for example certain species gone extinct then it will affect it as well another very good example that i study sun bears yeah so back in 1999 uh, some of my sun bears starved to death in a forest okay and then uh, and then starved to death in the forest and then in kalimantan one of my friends uh, study also the same thing the sun bears in her study area in kalimantan also very gross also very uh, starving and then uh, and then in my study area bearded pigs you know bearded pig with the wild boar in Borneo also starved to death and then uh, and then we 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 after in 2000 uh, 2001 then we know what happened you know uh in 2000 uh i start to realize that ficus that i mentioned the fig air fig tree uh, the uh, uh, keystone species is very important to uh to the survival of of, of, of sunday because when a sun bear found a floating fig tree they will stay there and eat and sleep and pool eat sleep and pool for about two weeks until the fig resources de depleted and then then i realized that oh figs are so important to the bears and other wildlife in the forest but when I look at my uh, field notes, I don't recall in 1999 that the, that, that the bears feed on figs, ficus, because this, I also do not come across any fig tree fruiting in 1999. And then, uh, so what happened was that uh, we, I, at that time, I do not know what happened until 20, uh, 2001 when uh, Red Harrison, a uh, uh, PhD student, uh, uh, published his paper on figs and fig wasp mutualism relationship. So fig, fig wasp is a tiny little insect that pollinate the fig. Okay. And then, uh, and then, and his study found out that in 1999, fig wasps gone locally extinct in his study area in Lambay Hill National Park in uh, Sarawak. And why is that fig wasp gone locally extinct? It's because of 1997-97 El Nino. Very hot and dry weather stress the the tree the fig tree that produce very little crops, and then uh, very hot weather kills a lot of the fig wasps, and most importantly is the fire. First fire wipe out the entire fig wasp population, and then when there is no fig wasp come and pollinate the fig, the fig would abort the fruits when it is still green. So eventually, when there's no fig wasp can and pop pop pollinate the fig, the fig tree would know uh, there's no pollination come and pollinate the fig. There's no point for them to put energy to develop the fig into a ripe fig. Okay, so then they drop the development of the green fig, which is not edible. So, at it, so, so because of that, the bears have no food to eat in 1999. You see, so you see, this has made me think about it is so important to have this intact ecosystem because one is like a ripple effect, it's like a domino effect. The, the species, the, 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 it will affect the fig, the fig or board. And then after that, there's no food for the bears. You see this domino effect? This is what we call as the cascading effect. Same with the bees as well. When bees gone look, when gone extinct, we will have no food. We will have no op apple. We will have no, you know, all the fruits that we are eating, little they eat. Uh, and then we will be suffering as well. So, so yes, very, very important. Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it, just to add a little bit of that. Uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, we are part of that domino. So, you know, if not, if anything happened to, you know, any uh, part of that domino, then we will be affected. So, so yeah. Thank you for your answers, Dr. Wong and Mr. Masro. Welcome. Voices have been saying that the lifestyle of rich countries is incompatible with the increasing number of humans on Earth. Voices that repeatedly say that we need to change our way of life or we need to ensure that there are fewer of us, otherwise the earth will not be able to satisfy everyone. In spite of those voices, the state of the environment continues to worsen. Air pollution is getting worse, clean water is becoming scarce, 
the climate is becoming in balance and yet as regards a way of life nothing has changed we know what needs to be done we know what should no longer be done but with a few exceptions we don't manage to change our habits so dr wong and mr masro why is the same thing always being repeated without anyone doing anything <laughs> masro you want to go first or me go first yeah, yeah I, i go for it and uh, maybe you can add uh, add on okay uh, so yeah why is being repeated i think yeah part of the problem is uh, like what the two wong said earlier we have too many people in this world too many people in this world i think i think it's becoming even more serious now i think one of the reason is because uh we we can see it more now because of social media and that with social media we have all of this uh I personally i want to call it unhealthy habit that we are doing now uh you know maybe i want to give example that more relatable to you know to both of you younger generation uh one uh, uh, cu- culture that i you know i'm i'm not supporting is like this uh, you know this uh, they call it mukbang is it mukbang mukbang culture where you know people try to eat as many you know food as you know as they can in one sitting i mean you know that's that's not normal at all and then can you imagine you know if so many people is doing that you know what what's going to happen to the resources in this world you know remember that we were discussing that all of these resources is you know they are you know they, they are limit to it so if everybody going to eat like a king the earth will not have enough okay uh so so it, it come back to you know human behavior so it's come back to human behavior uh so yeah we need to change the way we we live uh you know it can be some people say that you know uh you you know you stop using straws you know that going to save the environment then you know that's some people argue you know something you know that's a small of action but you know i, I think i disagree a little bit because i think if you want to you know uh achieve you know uh, this uh, say saving the you know uh, the, the mother earth we need to start small we need to start you know even something like that especially with the younger generation the reason why because this small action will become a habit because you know and then it will become a habit uh, when it's become a habit when the day come that we need to talk about this issue you know when you talk to kids when you talk to teenagers you know uh, it will not be a new concept to them all right so the idea is that Uh, we want uh, more people to do this because you will not be able to do take action if you don't understand the problem all right so for you to understand the problem you need to learn and then you need to care because you know if you don't care then you know it's going to be a bit difficult because you can't relate to the problem all right so it's going to take effort from everybody it's going to take effort from you know you and me it's going to take effort for you know from people in power uh because you know they their action can have a big impact you know but we cannot you know just put uh all of this on them because like i said you know we need to start you know small uh ourselves as well even though you know it's uh, it seems insignificant but you know like i said you know you are creating a habit because you know when uh, let's say you know people like, like you yourself you know when when you are you know you finish uh, at school and then you know when so one day you're going to talk about you know you're going to become a lawyer uh, pawanjit so you know that you know these issues are not going to be a new issues to you because you're being exposed to this you learn something tonight then you know so you know when you want to make decision you're going to make a you know a better decision for the environment so i think you know that's we need to uh start you know uh, with all of this uh, action uh, being it small being it big because like you said if not you know we gen- you know going to keep repeating uh, you know the, the same process again but the good thing is i think now probably the best you know best time to you know uh, to 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 do it because now uh, it's becoming easier to share information you know example like you know uh, i'm talking about the Kuala you know Kuala Langat forest reserve that you know that's because of the public reporting it now we have drone you know if people re- say something you know oh, i saw something something you know you can fly your drone and go and check it because the technology is there now so you know uh so yeah uh i think yeah we need to change the behavior uh, human behavior and then we need to change not just you know uh human behavior like individual level but you know everybody uh people in power uh you and me uh you know uh, organization Uh, somebody that run a business so everybody need to do something 
Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what Mansur said. You know, this is a collective issue, and then the the education is so important. Well, first of all, is that it is the human nature, lah. You know, when you talk about human nature, it means I, yeah, uh, like say the use of plastic bag. Okay, when I go to the local market here in Sanakan with my with my uh, with my uh, shopping with my shopping basket, uh, oh, every all the kaka, all the machi say, oh, chanti, bagus ini, you know what. Uh, uh, environment protection and blah blah blah. Is is I I I I feel like okay. I at least do something, yeah. And I hope other people would follow. Most of the people have this attitude of that. Even if I use less, other people also use ma. So it's not going to be used, you know. It's so it's it's not going to help, you know. Actually, it does if everybody knows about it. So back and then everybody knows about it. When we say when I say everybody knows about it means that the education is very important. Everybody needs to know, aware of this issue, the environment protection issue, the biodiversity issue is important. Okay. So always have the, have the, uh, have the hasrat, have the cita-cita, you know, so that one day in our school, especially from kindergarten, we talk about environmental issue, environmental education is become part of our curriculum and everybody growing up by learning about the environment how to protect them by knowing about you know the wildlife by knowing about the biodiversity and how we should protect them you know for my perspective for my experience i think you know there are three different processes like what must said the first is to understand you know first you understand yeah and then after you understand you start to care care comes from your heart no one force you to do that and then after you care come from your heart and then you want to act you start taking action you know so this is a process and then after that hopefully by taking action things will start to change but if you don't understand if you don't know if you don't educate yourself about this issue there's no way to start you don't see the issue you, you don't see the problems so all so back to square one again the square one is education so that's why for us, we have to educate our kids about environmental issue. Love nature, take care of environment. Don't buang sampah la, you know. Uh, reduce your waste la, you know. Conserve our resources la, you know. Don't don't eat too much la, you know. Don't why wow, you can only eat this portion and then you take a lot. Wow, sometimes I go to restaurant, it makes me very very angry because my. Wow, they have ordered a lot of food at the end they eat a small portions it's so sad really really so sad you know because all of that can either come from i mean come from the nature come from you know people's planting or growing or whatever it is a resources and if we don't conserve our resources uh, then then gone you know like what uh, gandhi used to say our earth is enough for everybody's need but it is not enough for everybody's greed yeah the need and the greed is an issue and then humans is the only species on earth i think that have the greed of. so that is a very very important factual that we all need to need to need to know and how are we going to control our greed so that we can only only take the needs that we need and do not you know have all this greed so that is something that we need to think of and then the second of course is the political will you know the leaders um have to do something you know have to lead have to show us what is the uh the right path to go you know what is the good policy to conserve to protect yeah to save this and that so that is very very important so so uh political will definitely and of course you know educate the general public about this yeah so, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong and Mr. Masro. I do agree on your explanations, and I think if there is still no action taken by the community, then our ecosystem will definitely take a real downfall in the future. Yeah. Dr. Wong, can we relate the COVID-19 pandemic with the burst of biodiversity instability where it leads to new viruses or new health crises? Yeah, so definitely, definitely. Okay, so you need to know that, you know, whether this is uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you know, the COVID, the virus that caused the COVID pandemic. 
oh, this is a Nipah virus that happened in our country. If you know about Nipah virus that happened in uh, 1998, 1999, and then outbreaks of this virus uh, come from, uh, after a study, they found out that uh, the, the, it is uh, originated from bats, and then bats come to feed on the fruit trees in, on top of the pig farm, and then and then the uh, virus travel from bats to fruits, fruits, and then the pigs eat the fruits, and then caught this virus. And then there's a lot of example whether you you know we know about uh, Ebola, say for example, we know about uh, HIV virus. It is all about what it is all about. These virus used to live way far away from humans, deep in the jungle, deep in the bats, and never have any contact but because of humans start to grow people uh, humans start to clear forest people go to the forest to hunt and to a point where wildlife and people start to meet usually is humans hunt humans hum this wildlife and then start to contact these viruses that used to contain in an animal's body for a long long time and because of that it jump host you know, if this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, COVID nine, COVID nineteen, the the, the virus SARS uh, CoV two uh, virus, if the theory is right about it is actually transmitted from bats to pangolin, and then people in Wuhan wet market eat the pangolin and therefore uh, contracted the virus, I actually buy that kind of uh, theory because it is not the it is not the first time. It is when these viruses that used to contain deep in the jungle and right now because of human population grow human have more access to deep jungle or human clear forest and human hunt you know and then we have contact with this uh with this uh, uh health issue you know and this is this is definitely not new but people never learn people never learn you know as i for uh, for me i'm a wildlife biologist i always say keep wildlife wild you know, our wildlife have to keep wild in the jungle. We must have jungle for them to live so that we don't have to invade, so that we don't have contact with them. Don't eat wildlife. Don't keep wildlife as pets. Keep wildlife wild. If not, you will have another outbreak. It's just like another time bomb. It is not their fault. It is not the wildlife fault. You know, this viruses, bacteria, or zoonotic disease used to be them for a long, long time until we invade their space. We kill their life. We kill their mother. We keep them as pets and things like that. You know, and then, uh, so this is something that we all need to, need to be aware of and have to learn from the example over and over again. But again, human never learns. Uh, that is one fact. And when will human learn? I hope, I hope, you know, this, this, this pandemic, this, 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 COVID-19 pandemic, you know, people right now are talking, I was so sad, you know, people talking about uh, uh, vaccination, people talking about, oh, there's a lot of debate about, you know, the whole slur, the origin of this virus, but people do not talk about how to prevent it, you know, how to prevent from the next pandemic of happening. I think we should, you know, the governments or the politicians or whoever needs to, or the WHO need to put more efforts on educating how to prevent it, how to stay away from wildlife and that kind of thing. Don't invade wildlife because this zoonotic disease is something that is not play play or, you know, for the Nipah virus, although it, it, it costs, you know, the outbreak is very quick. The, more, the, more, the mortality rate of Nipah virus is 70%. You know, it's very, very high. And then uh, there are, I think, about 100 uh, pig farmers, including my friend. One of my friends died. You know, because he is uh, one of the uh, pig farms owner, and then uh, yeah, so that is that this kind of thing happened in our country before. You know, uh, Nipah virus. If you Google Nipah virus, uh, it is an outbreak in uh, it's as started in Ipoh, and then after that, you know, in Bukit Plando, uh, in the Greece and Bilan also have another outbreak. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing happened. So so we should we should take this as an as a as a good lesson. Um, yeah, to learn and hopefully it won't happen again. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wong. So moving on, uh, Mr. Mazrul, do you think that the Malaysian law is enough to protect the environment? Uh, I think it can be made better. 
uh, you know, because if you said that whether the law is enough uh, to protect the environment, uh, but you know, people will argue that you know, if it's enough, then why did we see you know we are losing more and more uh, you know areas we we are losing more and more of our jungle. So yeah, I think yeah, people do believe that you know uh, certain law need to uh, you know can be improved uh, you know in terms of implementation in term of policy between you know federal and state government you know uh, I, I don't know about the details but you know definitely you know it, it can be made better, uh, better and then another example is uh, now uh, you're looking at uh, law that to, uh, you know to punish people that you know treat uh, treat uh, animal treat a uh, wildlife you know people like to keep uh, wildlife as pet now you see that you know people are keeping uh, gibbons People are keeping, you know, a uh, lot of this uh, primate as well. You know, even sun bear. You know, you see people are uh, trading it openly uh, online. So you know, we need a uh, you know update to the law. So you know, we need uh, a law that better protect and also punish people that commit you know such crime. Because at the moment, I don't think the punishment is harsh enough because uh, people are still doing it. Uh, you know, people are still doing it. Uh, so yeah, we need you know uh, we need to set an example. You know, the government, you know, the authority need to set an example to show that you know this uh, kind of crime uh, is serious because it impact uh, our biodiversity. Uh, so yeah, so to, you know to answer that, I think it you know it, it can be made uh, better. Uh, you know, and uh, with a little bit of improvement. Yeah, can I add something? Yes, yes. Me. Yeah, I think I, for me, I think our law is sufficient, okay? And then, but what we need is the enforcement, the enforcement part. You know, uh, say for example, like Mastro mentioned about gibbons, all this monkey being treated on Nyla or keep on pets. We have the law to protect them, but the enforcement, how to catch them, how to prosecute them. Not only after we enforce the law, you know, the next thing is to prosecute them in court. So we must form a good enforcement team, very effective in enforcement team. And I always have the, again, another hush track, yeah? you know, so that our wildlife crime is treated as human's crime. You know, a, a, a poaching issue is treated as a homicide case where you involve the police, come and investigate with, you know, very high end, top notch forensic technology, yeah, uh, to investigate this crime scene, to investigate this wildlife crime, just like humans crime. And then after that, the whole enforcement team work together with the uh, prosecution team, prosecute those culprits in the court. And then the judge needs to be aware that this is a serious crime and then punish those people who breaks our law to a maximum sentence in order to create a deterrence for other people not to do that again. That is a very, that is a three-way system, okay? First, we must have the law. Second, we must have the enforcement. If you don't have, if you have the law and don't have the enforcement, it is useless. You know, if you have the enforcement, if you have the law and enforcement, if you don't have the prosecution's uh, power to prosecute it in court, and then, uh, then it is okay. That guy will be like, ah, okay, being or either being punished very lightly, or you know, not guilty. Then they are released. Then you back to square one again. So these three process is extremely important in order to protect our wildlife, to protect our environment. I mean, this is not just wildlife. You know, talking about people who like pollute our rivers, say for example. You know, the same thing as well. And I really, really hope that our wildlife crime will be treated as a human crime, where it involves very, very serious top-notch investigator or enforcement uh, of uh, personnel to conduct the work and then present it to the court with, you know, with uh, with competence prosecutor and and and, and prosecute those people. Yeah. So that is that is the way to go. I think. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wong and Mr. Mazrol. I do agree with it as well. Um, so, thank you so much. I hope everyone sees how important it is to preserve the biodiversity of our planet.
Thank you for the informative and enlightening sharing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the question and answer session. If anyone has any questions, I'm sure our panelists will be pleased to answer them. So let me check the questions from Facebook and YouTube. We have uh, the first question. It is uh, directed to Dr. Wong. With climate change being at or at an all-time high, which direction do you see biodiversity taking? Do you see nature adapting, producing more species, tolerant to the changes, or is it a mass extinction of flora and fauna more likely to happen? Okay, I think, you know, global climatic change, you know, well, first of all, you need to aware that our biodiversity in our country or in planet Earth takes a long time to evolve to the stage where we are today. Okay, say, for example, our rainforest is 130 million years. And then a lot of the life from a lot of the plants, animals uh, have been in this forest for all this long, slowly adapt, 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 adapt to a point today. The climate change is something that is happens so quick, so quick for a for an earth historic time, you know. And then there's a lot of plants and animals don't have the, the, the ability to adapt, to change, and then they are being wiped out. So that is the most scary part, yeah? But global climatic change is happening so quick where they don't they might not have sufficient time to adapt and change and because of that we might lose those species that cannot adapt or have no time to adapt you know yeah so say for example plant animal can still move yeah from easily move from you know place one to place b yeah and then uh, but for plants you know usually they need to use a long time several generations to disperse the seed disperse the 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 their the, the seedling and then say for example if it is warmer temp temperature they need to climb up to a higher elevation animals can climb up but the plant cannot climb up even if the plant can even even if the animals can go move up to higher elevation but if the food is not there then the animals is still won't be able to make it as well so it needs time and this this is just that this climate change happens so quick in a earth time scale you know and then to a point where we may lost a lot of species because of global climatic change and this is what is a uh, scary law you know yeah so so hopefully more people are more aware of that and then uh, we can we need to do something to 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 change it yeah okay Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wong. For the second question is directed to both uh, Mr. Mazrol and Dr. Wong. Marine biodiversity plays some important roles as habitat on island, on land. Sorry, please share your view on overfishing and also the pollution that happen in ocean. We also know oxygen much produced from marine, marine and plankton. What will be the future of human if you didn't preserve biodiversity? from the view of marine. Mm. Masro, you want to go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, yeah, marine, you know, marine pollution, yeah, ma you know, marine diversity, yes, yeah, it, it is uh, correct, you know, uh, most of our oxygen come from the ocean. Uh, and then the, one of the biggest problem with the uh, ocean that we are facing right now is uh, overfishing. Number one is uh, pollution uh so so yeah uh pollution you know i think you see we see enough uh you know uh footages enough photos of uh there are so many plastic uh in the ocean uh not just you know plastic that are visible but also you know talking about plastic that are not you know visible to our naked eye like micro plas uh, plastic that already uh you know into our uh, food system so we are eating plastic when we are you know consuming fish so without we even knowing it so yeah it, it is a uh, you know a big problem uh, and uh, yeah i think it, it is you know as important as you know preserving our jungle but maybe you know the because of the the uh, more emphasis are being given on you know uh, jungle because you know the most of the images most of the you know you'll see that because uh images of deforestation 
uh, it looked more, you know, uh, very graphic. Uh, and then I think people are giving, you know, much more attention to, you know, uh, mammal uh, because we have a lot of iconic uh, mammal species. But yeah, I do agree that, you know, we need to pay equal attention to uh, uh, marine, uh, you know, uh, conservation uh, and marine uh, biodiversity as well. Hmm. Yeah. Well, for me, you know, the, the question is, what will be the future of humans if we don't preserve biodiversity from the view of marine? We'll be doomed as well. Same thing, because we are part of the, the, the global planet Earth ecosystems. And there are many, many people, humans, you know, dependent on the fishery as a source of protein, you know, dependent on fish as a source of protein. If the fisheries collapse, we will not do well. If the fish collapse, you know, other bigger fish or other species in, in life will not do it well. So we are all in this together. And it will be, you'll be a surprise that, you know, our life and everything else is so tied on to either life on land or either life on the sea or the water. You know, very, very interconnected. You know, it's now today's, especially when the human population is is, is so high right now. There are many, many people dependent on the sea. And it is scary that if we don't have this kind of resources, if we don't sustain, we manage our uh, marine resources, you know, we are not doing good or we are not going anywhere. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Wong and Mr. Masro. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, no, uh, that's all. That's all. Great. That's all for questions. Uh, I'm going to pass the floor to Bowen. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, we have reached the end part of our forum today. Thank you once again to our dear audience and to our experienced panelists for your active participation throughout the forum and our panelists, Dr. Wong and Mr. Mazro, for sharing us your time and knowledge for this forum today. It is our honor and pleasure to have you today. For those who have joined the forum tonight, you will be receiving a digital certificate. The Google link is provided below in the chat box. And the code is BIO123. I repeat, BIO123. Please fill up your details. It is our hope you have gained knowledge and has been inspired with today's forum. Once again, thank you to everyone for attending. And we are Pavanji and Koshla Subramaniam, wishing you all have a great day. All right, we did it. Done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. So I would just like to add something. This is Hall of Aspire, a place to satisfy your thirst for knowledge. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to invite me and of course Marshall as well. And to share our knowledge, share with you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.